If you feel like you're at the end of your rope and that knot you tied doesn't seem to be holding anymore, well, I have good news for you. If you're holding on to the rope of faith, that rope will never fail, even if you feel like it has. That's what we're going to talk about all this week, the trial of your faith. And that's straight ahead as Arkansas Live starts right now. Let's start where we left off yesterday in Psalm chapter 18 and verse 30. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. You know, if you can get this straight in your thinking, your days of worry and anxiety and fretting are over. You have to realize that God has already given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. It's yours. As far as God is concerned, He has already given to you. It says that in Peter, the epistle of Peter. It says that God has given to you everything that pertains to life and godliness. So if God has already given it to us, it's not Him that's holding it back. And I want to go one step further. It's not him that you, that you should be beseeching and uh, bombarding heaven to give you what you need. He's already done it. He's already given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. So your situation right now in your life is not God's fault. It's our fault. My wife and I prayed for a family member the other day. And uh, th- this is a great example of what I'm talking about. And she had been dealing with all kinds of uh, nausea and not feeling good and tired and weary and all that. And she was just, just, you know, laying there. And we went over and prayed for her. And when we got there, we realized she had already made a decision. She had, she told us, she said, I just thought to myself, I'm not going to lay in this bed anymore and just mope around and feel sorry for myself. I'm not going to lay in this bed anymore. I'm going to get up and fix dinner and I'm going to enjoy life. Bang. That's what turned the corner. That's what made the difference. She decided. You remember when Jesus told the woman uh, with the issue of blood, he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. So sometimes we're waiting on God or we're believing God and we're trying to get God to move on our behalf. He's already moved. That's the legal side of redemption. God has already given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. The vital side of redemption is our application. That's where our faith comes in. We attack or attach what God has already given to us in the kingdom with our faith. And I say attack because sometimes you have to attack the lack with your faith. Now, at the end of this week, we'll probably talk about seed faith and how uh, you plant your seed and you see that faith is a servant and your seed will come up and produce a great harvest for you. But Let's, let's go back to the fact that the word of the Lord is tried. It says here, uh, God's perfect in all his ways, and the word of the Lord is what's being tried. Now, let's find this over in the New Testament. Let's go over to um, Mark's gospel, chapter 4 and verse 17. And this is the parable of the sower. This is he that soweth the word. Verse 17, Mark 4. And have no root in themselves. This is a, he's talking about four categories of people, four types of people. And this group has no root in themselves and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. What was the persecution for? What did the trial come to do, to steal their faith. It came for the word's sake. You see, if, if Satan can 
get that word out of you. And of course, that's what it says in the first group of people. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they've heard, Satan comes immediately to take a word, away the word that was sown in their heart. The word of God is living, powerful, quick, sharper than any two-edged sword. The word of God pierces asunder, divides between the soul and the spirit and the marrow of the body. When you get that word of God on the inside of you and faith ignites and you know that you know that you know, then Satan can't stop that. So he has to try and prevent you from hearing the word. And my brother and sister, in, in all respect and, and uh, value, that's what's happened to a lot of our churches today. They have traded the word of God uh, for the pop culture, uh, visitor-friendly, seeker-friendly uh, mantle, just being a place of gathering, entertainment, whatever, but not teaching the word of God. If you don't teach the word, the people have nothing to grab hold of and their faith will always remain weak. It'll never be strong. And Satan will come and give you all kinds of <laughs> placebos to try and get you to believe that this is okay, that's okay, whatever you're doing is okay. But it's not. The, the attack on your faith, the, the trying of your faith, Satan is after the word. If he can stop you from believing the word of God, he can stop you. But if he can't stop you from believing the word of God, he can't stop you. So the trying of your faith is not God trying to chasten you, slap you, buffet you. That isn't God. God isn't using anything or anybody uh, to uh, chasten you or rebuke you. He's, he's not using evil. <laughs> James 1.13 says, don't say when you're tempted of evil, I'm tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted thee any man with evil. So the trying of your faith, the trustworthiness of your faith is proven when you use your faith and Satan is trying to stop you from using it. He's trying to keep you out of the word. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when you want to pray, <laughs> you you make a, an appointment to pray. You make a time. You make a room, a place. And you say, okay, Lord, I'm going to pray uh, at such such a time on this day or every day or where." And every time you start to pray, something pops into your mind that is totally irrelevant, has nothing to do with the prayer or what you're doing, but it's, it's a carnal thing. It's a silly thing. Oh, uh, did I... Uh, turn the fire off under the stove, uh, under the tea kettle, or uh, you know my yard needs mowing. <laughs> and so, you know, Satan's job is to keep you out of the Word, to keep you sidetracked. Uh, oh, you, you, he puts thoughts in your mind. He puts thoughts of unforgiveness. He, it, it can be some totally in innocent. You you get ready to pray, and all of a sudden you think about. Uh, there's a sale going on down at the store and I can't wait to get to that sale. All that is to distract you. Oh, I can't wait till we go out to eat tonight. I want to go to that restaurant. All of that is to distract you. People have those thoughts in church. They're in church. They may have their hands lifted. They may be singing, but they're thinking about lunch. <laughs> All of that is tricks of the enemy. So he is trying to steal the word. And of course, if the pastor's not preaching the word, uh, Satan's already got half the battle won there. So uh, to be uh, proving, trying of your faith means the trustworthiness of your faith. Tried with fire, proved by lightning or fiery darts. Ephesians 6.16, we read this yesterday. Uh, why is your faith tried? Psalm 18.30, the word of the Lord is what's being tried. Uh, go over to Galatians chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6, and let's look at verses 7 through 9. Galatians 6, 7 through 9, and read this with me out of your Bible. Don't be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, 
but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Due season is the time of harvest for the word that you've sown, the word that's been sown in your heart or the word that you've spoken, the act of faith. The due season is the time for that harvest to come up. And if you'll notice in the Bible, it talks about in uh, Genesis, seed time and harvest, seed time and harvest. You plant your seeds and in time you will have a harvest. But if you give up, if you quit, if you stop believing, see, sometimes it appears like your faith is not working but it's just like planting that garden in the spring. You put that seed in the ground or that plant in the ground and you don't see anything for a few days or maybe weeks or if we have cold weather or rainy weather, it might take longer. And you think, well, what's wrong with this? <laughs> you might pull it up, throw it away. You might replant, whatever. But if you just give it time, it'll come up and it'll start producing fruit. Okay. Uh, let's go over to Job chapter 34. Uh, you say, Pastor Caldwell, you're going to go over to Job and talk about faith? Oh, yeah. Job, the book of Job is a story of faith. Uh, well, I, th I thought Job was a, um, a, a story of um, boils and trials and tribulations and uh, suffering. Well, those things occurred. But that's not the story of Job. You need to read the whole book and find out that Job was under attack of the enemy. But at the end, he was rewarded for twice uh, as what he had. Job 34, and let's go to verse 10. Therefore, uh, hearken unto me, you men of understanding, far be it from God, that he should do wickedness and from the Almighty that he should commit iniquity. For the work of a man shall he render unto him and cause every man to find according to his ways. So God is not the one that is doing the wickedness. He's not the one that is uh, causing the problem. That is not the trying of your faith. So, oh, well, just old Job's going to have to move over and let me sit down. God's trying my faith. What, what do you mean by that? I've heard that. Uh, oh, God's trying my faith. Well, if you're going to go by a Bible definition, that means God is, prov is proving the trustworthiness of his faith. He, he, when, when he told the children of Israel to tithe, the nation of Israel to tithe, to bring 10%, the first fruits of all their increase, when he told them to bring the tithe into the storehouse, what did he say to them? He said, prove me now herewith and see if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. <laughs> prove me. Prove me with this. I'll show you what my word can do. God is not trying your faith with calamity and heartache and problems and roadblocks. He is proving the trustworthiness of his word, the trustworthiness of his um, faith. Now, let's go over to uh, uh, another scripture in the New Testament. Let's go over to 2 Corinthians because there have been many uh, misunderstandings and many um, things mistaught. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Now listen to what the Apostle Paul says. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now first of all, what's going on here? We're talking about the trial of your faith. It says the Apostle Paul, because of the abundance of revelations, he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, because of the abundance of the revelations, 
there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Now, a lot of people have surmised what that thorn in the flesh was. Some say it's a runny eye disease. Some say other things. But <laughs> the Bible tells you what it was. It says, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, to slap, to torment. Now, let's use a little logic, a little common sense here. If God sent the messenger of Satan to buffet Paul because of his revelations that God was giving him, then that'd be a house against, divided against itself, and the house divided against itself will fall. That would be God confused. I mean, God's given him the revelations. He's writing revelations throughout the New Testament. And then it says here, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Well, what was it? It, it wasn't an eye disease. It tells you, a messenger of Satan, a demon spirit. Why would God send a demon spirit to harass, to buffet, to slap Paul for the revelations that he's getting from God that are revolutionizing the church? You see, that old dog won't hunt. That, that's that's uh, ignorance gone to seed, as my friend Charles Capps used to say. Uh People have had help to misunderstand uh, the scriptures. And, and let's go on. For this thing, I besought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. And God said to me, oh, I'm sorry, Paul, uh, this is, this is uh, me trying your faith. No, that's not what he said. He said, my grace, my willingness to use my power on your behalf is sufficient for you. My grace is more than enough for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So then Paul says, hmm, okay. Well, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, not for my infirmities. Anytime there's an infirmity, anytime there's a problem, a trial, a test, I will glory in it that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You understand, I'm not glorifying, glorifying God for the problem. I'm not praising God for the problem. I'm praising God in the problem because the will of God is for me to praise Him. That's what it says in Thessalonians. You praise God in the situation, not for it. Because God didn't send the situation that's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. That's not God's MO. Therefore, I take pleasure. I mean, Paul really gets perfected in this. I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Hallelujah. Now, you understand, Paul is not thanking God for the problems. He is thanking God for the deliverance from the problems. Uh, let's uh, back up just a minute to chapter 11. And let's go to verse 24. This is concerning the Apostle Paul. Of the Jews five times, I received 40 stripes, save one. That's 39 stripes. Uh, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned, three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of water, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils uh, by the heathen, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea, and perils among false brethren. In weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Now, there are a lot of Christians saying, whoa, forget that. I don't want to, if that's what it takes to have great faith and just leave me alone, I don't want to suffer any of those things. But finish reading it. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh on me daily, the care of all the churches. Wow. Wow. Paul was not only talking about what he had faced and overcome out there in the world, but he said the care of all the churches that he oversaw. Who is weak? I'm not weak. 
Who is offended? I'm, I don't burn with envy. So if I must needs glory, I'll glory of the things which concern my infirmities. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. In one place, he said, and the Lord delivered me out of all these things. So would you be able to say, oh, look at Paul, the, the, the trying of his faith. Paul's faith was strong. God told him, he said, my grace is all you need. Just start thanking me and praising me because I'm God. Somebody needs to do that right now. You, it, the light switch came on. All you have to do is start praising God and thanking God for the victory, for your healing, for your deliverance, for your financial miracle. Just start thanking. Just start thanking. I don't care whether it's manifested or not. Don't, don't even go there. Just start thanking. Have you sowed the seed? Have you sown seed in the ground? Have you confessed and believed God for the harvest and the return? Then start thanking him for it. Just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thank you that my financial needs are met. I thank you I'm healed by the stripes of Jesus. I thank you that I'm delivered in my mind. And, and you just begin to praise God and thank him. <laughs> like the old farmer that was plowing one day, the Holy Ghost came on me. He just threw the reins up in the air and said, praise God. I feel like shouting. I got to shout. I got to thank God for his goodness and his mercy and his kindness. Okay. Uh, let's look at another scripture. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 10 and verse 13. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 13. And uh, this, this has often been uh, a bothersome a scripture for me, Second Corinthians chapter ten. Um, oh, I think I've got the wrong one. First Corinthians thirteen ten. Let's try that. First Corinthians thirteen ten. First Corinthians thirteen ten. Well. <laughs> Excuse me just a minute. Second Corinthians 10, 13. Is that what I said? Well, I have written down the wrong scriptures. Let's go to another one. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 12, 7. 2 Corinthians 12, Seven. If you'll turn over there, I want to keep looking for this other one. <laughs> I know it's in here. I'm sorry. I'm just going to. Okay, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12, 7. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Oh, we just finished uh, reading that. Let's back up uh, to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, and let's look at verse 7. Hebrews 12, 7. Uh, this is one of the frustrating things in teaching about uh, the chastening of the Lord or the trying of your faith. In uh, Hebrews 12, 7, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us. Now that's what chastening means here as it's used. If you have been without chastening, it means to correct by instruction. If you've been without correction, um, then you're your bastards and not sons. For our fathers of the flesh gave us correction. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? Now, <clears throat> be sure and join me tomorrow because I want to pick this up and I'm going to find that scripture that I couldn't find uh, uh, for tomorrow's broadcast. But I want you to, to focus on this until we get together. The fathers of our flesh and the father of spirits. Both chasten us, both correct us, 
by instruction. We're talking about the trial of your faith. I want you to get a copy uh, of this book called No More Limits. This will help you tremendously. Take the limits off your life. Watch this, and I'll be right back. The year was 1999, and I was awakened one morning by the Word of God. I heard God say, no more limits. He told me that we had limited him, just like the children of Israel. Limits come from two sources. They're self-imposed, or they're imposed on us by others. I want you to get a copy of my book, No More Limits. To order your copy of No More Limits for $12.99 plus shipping, call us at 1-800-264-2525 or order online at vtntv.com. God has a specific plan for your life, and part of that plan is to walk in victory over every circumstance. Pastor Caldwell's book, No More Limits, is designed to help you understand how to remove self-imposed limits and live the abundant life God has for you. Order your copy today and see limitless results in your life. In this book, you will be taught how to conquer your limits. You'll be taught how to overcome any limit in your life. Uh, let's see, there's about 14 chapters. Uh, increase beyond your limits. How to overcome the limits of the world. Unlimited riches of God's resources. Uh, unlimited power within. Overcoming the limits of religious tradition. Get your copy today. Now, join me tomorrow as we continue uh, our teaching and our study uh, on the trial of your faith. And we're going to find out the difference between the chastening of your earthly father and the chastening of your spiritual father. And if you've had problems in these areas, I know my wife did for years. And when she heard me teach this, she said that solved the problem for her. And she realized that it wasn't God correcting her for her mistakes. He wasn't getting her for her sins. He wasn't chastening her. So this will help you too. So join me tomorrow for the next edition of Arkansas Live. And remember, Jesus is Lord of Arkansas. And wherever you're watching in the world, too. Send your questions, comments, and testimonies to Happy Caldwell at Post Office Box 26207, Little Rock, Arkansas, 72221. Or email happycaldwell at vtntv.com. Remember to follow VTN on Facebook at VTN Your Arkansas Christian Connection and follow Happy Caldwell on Twitter at Happy underscore Caldwell. VTN is on Roku. Search VTN in the channel store and add us to your lineup. Today's episode is available to watch on demand at VTNTV.com and click watch. You can also watch VTN via live stream at VTNTV.com.